this time I'll call the meeting to order. We have two items on the agenda. Um, I'd like to go ahead and lay some ground rules out before we get started. The process will be is that we'll start and when we move into the public hearing portion of the meeting, then the opposition will have 10 minutes. The, uh, in support of those folks that's in favor, will have 10 minutes as well. And then following those comments, then we'll have two minutes of rebuttal for each side moving in the same process with the opposition going first and then those that are in support going second. So also I'm going to ask that we do not solicit any <coughs> comments, gestures, stand up, what have you in the, uh, in the audience. We're going to run a civil orderly meeting. So if you would, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first agenda item is the public hearing item A. This is a rezoning case of REZ 2022-10, the campus transitional facility. This is in regards to the validity of the April 11, 2023 decision. Mr. Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, commissioners. On March 28th, the board began and voted to table the public hearing on a request to rezone property at 2193 Hallow Road from a state agricultural to plan development for uses including a transitional care facility until its April 11th meeting, at which the board continued the public hearing on the request and voted to rezone the property to plan development. The county has received a challenge to the validity of the April 11th decision based on the notice to the public. Declaring the April 11th zoning decision invalid and reconsidering rezoning the property will make this challenge moot. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Dillon? Okay. We'll move into the public participation portion of the hearing. And those that are in opposition, if you would please come forward and state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Savannah Baker. I reside at 4046 Old Naylor Road, 2.2 miles from 2193 Howell Road. We have addressed collective concerns for my family and the community that surrounds me in regards to the rezoning of 2193 Howell Road for over a year now. I have been able to provide cited facts and statistics in regards to a facility like this, yet they have been unable to provide a success rate for their program that has been in business for six years now. Ma'am, would you please pull the mic in front of you? Thank you so much. Or cite where their information and statistics come from. I would like to quote a Bad Austin Daily Times article titled, County should always lean to residents in zoning decisions from May 6, 2023 in reference to another zoning request in Lowndes County. The following was stated, the voice of the people should always matter the most to the local government. Residents have every right to have a say regarding what happens in their own communities. The people we elect to office should always listen to the women and men they represent. In the same article, it refers to a group of citizens that signed a petition in opposition for rezoning in their area of the county and only had 180 signatures and commissioners voted in favor of the citizens. But citizens of Lowndes in our community that signed our petition in opposition with a number of over 500 signatures feel as though they were completely ignored and confused as to why commissioners did not vote in favor of the citizens in our case with three times the signatures the other group of citizens had. It has also been apparent that the voices of the community have been silenced after several news articles and interviews have been altered since released or deleted altogether with no available access to them. They have said their guys know where drug houses are within X amount of distance of their property on Howell Road, which is undoubtedly true. But how are the people in your program aware of the locations? And if it's true, do you think this is the best place to put your facility? Also, if it is true, have you notified the Sheriff's Office of their locations? If not, why? Time and time again, this group has shown that they have no integrity by lying repeatedly to the commissioners. We have already provided evidence that their curriculum vitae is non-existent and the program is not taken seriously. With looking into information provided by them about this program, research was done in regards to a few things. First, it was stated that they have been at their current address for two years, and law enforcement has only been called one time. Upon retrieving records, it revealed that in the past two years, there have been four times law enforcement was there, one of which was for an overdose, and another that was having a PTSD attack and wanted to get help elsewhere and be removed from there. They said they do not allow people with violent crimes in their program, but it was brought to your attention that they indeed did allow people that committed violent crimes in their program. They did say that they corrected their ways with that. However, I spoke with someone who was in their program in September of last year who had committed a violent crime. This shows that they have not corrected their ways and can't even abide by or enforce their own rules. Also, this program is repeatedly referred to as a ministry, yet on their 501c3, they're listed as non-religious and listed as a halfway house. 
I have also been informed that no one is required to attend anything they do not want to attend, and this shows that there is no accountability. There have been many people within our community with experience that have reached out to help this program's curriculum, but each one was turned down, including offers of compromise. They claim to be an open book, however, the public is no longer able to access any of their information packets on their website as they have all been removed. The community feels as though favoritism is being shown for the people requesting this rezoning since this meeting is being held today as opposed to the normal protocol for commission meetings in order to meet a certain deadline. We sincerely hope that you heed our concerns that citizens have brought to your attention and keep the best interests of Lyons County citizens in mind when making another decision. I would now like you to hear from someone who experienced this program firsthand. Please state your name and address for the record, please. Good afternoon, my name is Justin Stafford. I reside at 118 West Alden Avenue, about Austin, Georgia. Um, I wrote something down about 118 West, and I am a recovering alcoholic. When it comes to the topic of addiction, those who personally experience the destruction associated with the choices made that lead to that lifestyle know it only ends one of two ways. You either get help or you die. After running and failing time and time again, I realized that if I did not receive help, my life would end before I knew it. I sought that help and regained sober living. After a decade of alcoholism, ruining relationships, losing friends and family, being fired from jobs, I finally reached a point of self-destruction with only one choice left to make, getting help. I checked myself into the crisis center in Thomasville to detox, and then enrolled in the Phoenix Rehabilitation Program upon completion. I found myself homeless, but still wanted to continue on the road to sobriety. I reached out to redeem some relieving to keep myself accountable and have a place to call home, only to find out no accountability took place here. During my short time there, it occurred to me very quickly that addicts seeking recovery came second to those in charge handling their business first. It is not my intention to speak ill of anybody or belittle any individual, but after receiving the treatment I got, it's important to me to prevent anyone else from having to experience that. Redeem Sober Living is not structured to keep the recovering addict accountable, with only having one AA or NA meeting per week, minimal certified staff on hand, there's too much downtime for the healing mind to wander. The handbook stated certain rules and regulations that were never enforced, such as keeping track of house members with the Life360 app or direct curfew. While drug tests were performed every Sunday, I personally witnessed house members failing the tests and suffered no consequences. What's most unsettling to me is that the addicts who live at the recovery house are also employed by the same person who owns the house. I would go as far as calling an exploitation using an individual seeking help from addiction, giving them a place to live and employing them at the same time. The agenda isn't to help, it's to expand the long-term business. Since Redeem offers the bare minimum of recovery, accountability, and services, it seems beneficial only on the surface. But paying attention and looking deeper, you see that it's business first and recovery second. Before I made the decision to become healthy, I had broken the law and warrants were issued for my arrest. When I went to jail to pay for the crimes I committed, Redeem was all I had to lean on. I counted on them to do what they said, which was be there and fight for me. After being incarcerated for three weeks, they started ignoring my calls, and I no longer heard from them again. They never reached out or responded to my calls or messages. They even went as far as to block me on social media. They completely abandoned me, moved my belongings out of the house, and washed their hands clean. If you're looking for a job and a place to live, redeem sober living is for you. If you're looking to actually receive recovery help for your addiction, I would never recommend it. Thank you. Here we have about three and a half more minutes. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in opposition? Jed Al, Wayne Kent, Al Ray. Um, through this whole process, I, I had to do a heart check, basically, because I want people to get help. And uh, but all I have to go back on is the past and the experiences I've had. And work construction, we worked a guy several years ago that uh, come out of jail out here for drugs. Uh, I worked him. Put a lot of confidence in him. He stayed clean. I took him to his meetings every week. Um, he uh, he was younger. He befriended my kids. He spent time in my house. I trusted him 100%. I had got to the point where I was going to give him a crew and buy a truck and put him you know, over other individuals in the construction. Uh, we finished up the job in December, and it was my practice to catch up around the house if I could there at the first of the year. We had a little break around Christmas time. I paid everybody their Christmas bonuses. Um, 
I think it was the day before Christmas Eve, the law showed up at my house looking for him. So all it took was that little bit of money and opportunity, and he went on binge. He broke into his mom and dad's house, stole some things. When he ran out of money, um, when she confronted him, he got he threatened her. And eventually he was put in jail. He didn't get back in my employment, but that span that I'm talking about was over a year and a half. And then we just, he got an opportunity and he committed these crimes. Then I want to, I'm going to uh, move forward about eight years. And I was working on the job out here for the hospital, which is my employer now. We had a crew in there working. There was a, a supervisor that him and I hit it off. And we, you know, we, uh, we made friends. We went to lunch together. Um, I got to know him pretty good over this six or eight month span while we were working there. Um, a little later, we started another job. I didn't see him, so I asked about him. And they told me the story. Some of you recognize the story when I repeat it from the newspapers. They, uh, his boss man over on Savannah Avenue, he went in and stole that truck, his, his boss man's truck. He showed up on camera several times over here near Hudson Dock and bought drugs. Came back. The story is, as best the boss man can recount, he wanted to borrow more money. The boss man refused, and he beat that guy within an inch of his life. So he's in jail now, where he should be. He came back to work that morning with his boss man's blood still on his boots. And this guy had been clean for years. So he got an opportunity. And that's, I mean, that's all I had to go on was if you give these guys an opportunity, some of them can go back to the past and even in this instance turn violent. So if you need the whole story, probably know what I'm talking about, you can go over on Savannah Avenue and you can ask him, and if he's having a good day, he'll recollect much of that. If he's not, he's not even going to remember what happened to him. And so that's why my heart changed about having that facility right down the street from my house. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. All right, we have the 10 minutes is up for the opposition. We also have 10 minutes for those that's in support. You don't want to like to come forward and speak. <coughs> Take your name and address for the record. Brett Moore, 3850 C. Elmore Road. Uh, I just wanted to show proof I'm still friends with Mr. Justin Stafford on social media. Uh, nobody blocked him on social media. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, so <clears throat> here we are again, uh, I hear we had to be back in the situation again, but I just wanted to address some of the comments that were, that were made. I'm not sure of the two calls that she gave instance of, uh, to the address of where the reading is currently at. I uh, looked over at a couple of other people that are involved with the ministry. They don't know, they don't know those, about those either, so, uh, can't answer to those because I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, and it was a friend of mine who, who did inform me of the drug houses that were on Howell Road. It wasn't anybody who was currently in the ministry. Um, and it was, and no, I did not report them to the authorities because he did not dispose of the addresses. Didn't ask for them. Um, as far as the 501c3, it should be listed as a nonprofit, faith based nonprofit. I have no idea how it would not be. Um, because that is how we applied for it to be to be done. Um, I just want to once again remind y'all that this isn't a treatment facility. This is a secondary program where we are helping people get back on their feet after completing a program. Um, Justin obviously had a bad experience, and I hate that. I was never given the opportunity to uh, talk with him about his experience. Um, and, and to try to learn from whatever he may have uh, experienced in that time that he was, the several weeks that he was at Redeemed Living before his warrants got up with him. So um, I just ask that you continue to reconsider the, uh, the voting today whenever the opportunity comes to make sure that we do get this passed um, so that we can continue on with the ministry that God's called us to do. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor of this request?
Good evening. My name is Walter Muller. I live at 2801 Cotton Bay Crossing, approximately five miles from the location of the Howell Road where the Redeem living is hoping to uh, move into. I'm retired Air Force 20 years. I'm also recently retired 23 and a half years of mental health substance abuse counseling. I retired from uh, Penfield Addiction Ministries in Lapaha, Georgia. Similar situation when we opened up there. Uh, residents, and particularly the one that lived right next door, was in complete opposition. Had to go to the you know, to commissioners. And, uh, um, and the uh, facility was approved. Now, Brent had uh, visited out there a number of times, and I believe that it, the vision that he had sort of Penfield uh, played a part in that. And we were a six-week program, and the difference for the residents that would be at the Dean Living, they're further along. They have more sobriety. We had people coming right in. We didn't have, weren't, didn't have detox, but they had a detox. Um, and we had a success rate of over 90%. Uh, any type of uh, uh, facility, treatment facility, rehab, whatever, um, you're always going to have a few that aren't going to succeed with their recovery. I'm also I'm a recovering uh, alcoholic and addict. I recently uh, celebrated 35 years of sobriety without a drink or a drug, and I've counseled countless, countless addicts, alcoholics. This county needs a place like Redeem Living um, so people that need help can get it. The people that will be coming to this facility, once again, they'll be further along in their recovery. Their, uh, uh, and the last thing I'd like to say is my, my experience of coming from the heart. Um, if you take a recovering person's heart and you take it out of his body and put it on a table and you take a so-called normal person that's never been involved with drugs and alcohol, take out their heart and put it on the table, the recovering alcoholic addict's heart is going to be bigger. And I say that, I use this in therapy a lot, but I say that because the recovering, the alcoholic and addict has been to hell and they don't want to go back where the normal person might go to church not to go to hell. Big, big difference. This county needs a facility like this to help the judicial system to refer people to so they can get proper uh, therapy and uh, recovery. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor of this request? Anyone else that would like to speak in favor? Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. My name is David Barton. I live at 602 West Park Avenue near Valdosta. I'm a part of Redeemed and I came here three months ago. Uh, I went to a treatment program for nine months. Once. And I just want to say they do have accountability. Uh, me personally, I go to two church services a week. I go to two AA meetings a week at least, that, and also a DAA meeting. Uh, and I also do a discipleship. Uh, part of this program and the reason why I came was to become closer to God because they're a faith-based program. And so far, they have my back and support through this whole thing. And I'm very thankful for a place like this. Uh, people like me needed something, this transition coming out of a program, and I recommend it to anyone, and that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Here we have about two minutes and 40 seconds. Anyone else would like to speak in favor? Please 
My name is Joseph Daniel Lovato Jr. I stay at 603 West Park Avenue, Redeemed Living House. Uh, this has probably been, other than my family that adopted me, the best family that I've had to take my real wing, show me care, true love, compassion, giving me the accountability that I need. I have it in every room that I go into in that house. I've been to the house since uh, November, and I have yet once seen any kind of law come to the house, any kind of overdose. It basically boils down to wanting to change. If you're going to the house and you're doing, so to say, something happened there, that person or individual did not want to change, they truly didn't want it. I, like I said, I'm in the house with five other guys who have my back. <coughs> Whatever room I'm going to, I'm having a rough day. I know I don't have to go back to drinking alcohol just to get that temporary fix. That pat on the back saying you'll be all right. I go to CR meetings on Monday, which I'm missing today for this. It's very important for us. I go to my two church services as well. Um, very involved in the program with, with my, my church and my group of guys that are behind me right now. I didn't have anybody before on the streets when I came here from Tennessee, living homeless, and I've got a roof over my head that I'm blessed and thankful for each and every single day that I've been here. And that being said, thank you, guys. Okay, 45 seconds. If there anyone else would like to speak to you, thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right, hearing none, we'll offer the two minutes of rebuttal. And keep in mind, the question that we're actually on this agenda item is the validity of the previous vote. So we've heard a lot about the opposition from the actual request. But commissioners, your decision on this agenda item is on the validity of that vote. All right, we'll go ahead now. Is there anyone else, anyone in the, on the opposition that would like to rebuttal? Please come forward. Again, your name and address, please. You have two minutes. My name is Savannah Baker. I reside at 4046 Old Navy Road. Um, as to a rebuttal to what David just mentioned is, you know, he mentions how he's a friend or a friend of his told him where those houses were. Well, so a friend who he socializes with knows where the drug house is. Is that somebody you want to bring a facility of this measure um, who's associated with people who have knowledge of that? You know, people who should have knowledge of that as law enforcement, people who are using drugs, or people who associate with people using drugs. Um, if this isn't a transitional facility that includes a treatment facility within itself, then why are we hearing a rezoning for this if it doesn't even qualify as such, according to what he just said? Um, they are also drug testing people, when according to the state of Georgia, they're not legally allowed to be doing so. They do not have enough knowledge, training, or experience, or licenses to be doing something of this measure. Uh, the people that are in their program are attending things on their own accord. There's no one ensuring that they go if they don't want to attend anything. There's no structure to have them follow. Um, and I want to reiterate, as a community, we want people that, who need help to get help, but with an accurate amount of oversight of trained professionals. Anyone else? We've got about 50 seconds on the vote. It's in opposition. All right, hearing none, we have two minutes of rebuttal for those that are in support. Anyone want to rebuttal? Again, please state your name and address for Brett. Brett Moore, 3850 CL Moore Road. Uh, yes, I do associate with people who are in need of recovery. Um, it is one of my best friends from my childhood who is actually in a treatment facility currently um, who, uh, who informed me of this. So he was in, uh, in he was in active addiction when he told me this and we were talking on the phone one day about it. So yes, I do associate with people who do struggle in life and so we should all. Um, and also, uh, I wish I would have known I need to send it to you, but this is a form that we have filled out every Monday morning from the director uh, informing us of everyone, uh, what meetings they attended, um, where they attended them, and, um, and then also the daily quiet time, uh, the, the different chores and different things that they do around the house as well um, to ensure that they're taking and doing their part around the house as well as in the recovery. Um, so they are required. Uh, there are requirements for them to attend those meetings. 
Um, they are allowed to go, they can choose which ones they go to, but they are required to go to four meetings a week of some sort, two of which have to be church. So, oh, and uh, also the uh, comment that was made about me just trying to further my business uh, as far from the truth as it could be. Um, my business is very successful, and I've been very blessed, and I've never approached, I've approached one person was our first client that we had come in there and told me he had landscaping experience. And I said, man, that's all right. You know, I can help you find a job. And I hired him. And other than that, I've never approached another person that's walked through those doors to come to work for me. They approached me and asked me for a job. Some of them worked for me, some of them not. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, time's up. Um, so, commissioners, I'll close the public hearing portion of the meeting and I'll turn it back over to you for your consideration on this agenda. <coughs> Again, the question is the validity of the um, April 11th decision. Mr. Chairman, I um, move that we declare the April 11th, 2023 zoning decision invalid. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Need a second. And this is regards to the legal question of <coughs> it being valid or not, correct? That is correct. The, the time, the advertising issue is basically what it amounts to. So basically the advertising, you thought we didn't advertise it correctly, that makes that, that, that decision invalid. Is that what we're saying? Correct. That, that's the question before us, is that one of the challenges you might say that's been brought forward is the fact that we advertise the meeting to the meeting date that we had the meeting, we had the meeting, the decision was to table that agenda item to the next meeting, which we did and we heard the case at that time. So the question is, did the advertisement include the hearing? And I think that that's where the question is for Mr. Elliott, is that nobody knows. If, if you vote, there's a second on the motion, and the motion passes, then you will proceed to the next agenda item where you will hear the uh, item. I should hear the, the rezoning request. Uh, as our attorney, do you, do you recommend we make the, 11th, the April 11th vote invalid and then vote again? Yes, sir. Okay. So I second Dr. Marcus. Commissioner Marshall. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Sir. I'll call the vote. All in favor of declaring the meeting of April the 11th invalid, please raise your hand. Not the whole meeting, just this vote. The vote <laughs> of this agenda item. Okay, we have three. Two that knows, I suppose. So it's three to two. So meeting or this agenda out of this decision on April 11th has been declared in back. With that then we'll move on to agenda item 2B. <coughs>